Well, in the fickle world of television, our next guest has not only survived, but he's thrived. Peter Overton is set to hit a major milestone next week when Nine News Sydney claims its 10th year at the top of the ratings. But it wasn't an easy ride. To share his story, Peter Overton joins us now. Hello, Peter. Welcome to the Ben, Rob and Robbo show. Oh, what a treat. Ben, <laughs> Rob and Robbo. I love it. And it's lovely to see you again, Mr McKnight. We have quite a history, my friend. And I just love being able to, in these times, to be able to support us all in this industry and be on your show. It's terrific. I appreciate that, Pete. We have had a, a long history and it all started when you became the anchor of the 6pm uh, news service in Sydney. It was a little bit controversial at the time. The media were out to get you because Nine had had a few struggles at the time. It was a bumpy ride. They were desperate for Nine to fail again, but you proved them all wrong and you took that news service to number one and you've been number one ever since. Well, I think, uh, yes, I came from 60 Minutes. I'd had uh, eight or nine years travelling the world for 60 Minutes uh, and, th and then things changed, as you said. I think it was 2009 I went into the six o'clock seat and uh, the first two years we did, did OK, but it wasn't, wasn't great. And then for the last, we, we should go to, to number one for the last decade uh, if we win this week and things are on track. So um, it's been an, a fabulous uh, experience. I, I love every day of it. Um, and it only makes you work harder when you, you're running second because you've got a goal. And then when you, you get there, you've got to keep working even harder. As Brad Fittler said to me, the New South Wales Blues coach, and I know two of you, Robbo and Rob, are in Queensland, so with the greatest respect, uh, Brad Fittler, the winning New South Wales State of Origin coach, said to me, uh, to, be, right, <laughs> to be number one, you've got to train like you're number two. And I've always remembered that, always remembered that. It's so true, and and yeah. but it was hard during that time. You you and I had <laughs> some big conversations when you know the ratings wouldn't hit in the in that first period where we wanted, and Channel Nine was being uh, redeveloped at Willoughby, and I remember us having big conversations in the corridors with wires hanging down and it was the state of play at the moment. Everything was in disrepair and it was all in a rebuild mode and that's what it was for the first two years and then the momentum started and you should, you, you shot off basically. Well, I think what the, the key was for me and I remember those conversations clearly and I can tell you those wires are still hanging out of the roof so they're, <laughs> they're never going <gonna, laughs> um, <laughs> to... That's another story which we'll probably share a bit later but um, I, I always used to say to Darren Wick, our then Sydney News Director, and yourself, we, we were doing really good bulletins um, and we just had to keep doing good bulletins and believe in oneself. Whether you're a sporting team, you're a kid at school, you're doing the news, whatever it is in life, it's about giving your best. That's what the lessons I teach my daughter and our daughters, I should say, and, and that's how I operated. Um, and, and you were a big part of that, as was Wiki and the team. We do a our very best and keep doing your very best. Don't be despondent when things aren't going your way. And I, I believe that's the way uh, success is achieved. Uh, as I say, sporting teams, keep, keep going even if you're losing and you can turn the ship. Mm -hmm. So, Peter, I've got to ask you, what is it that you love about broadcasting, about TV broadcasting? What is, where, where does that passion, that flame come from for you? Robbo, this is my 29th year at Channel 9 um, and I still love going to work every single day. I'm excited every single day. And it all stems from growing up, I think, uh, wanting to know about people, wanting to know people's stories. And even to this day when Jessica and I go out um, for a date to the local Italian for a, a bowl of spaghetti, I'll interview the waiter. And uh, Jessica, what about... <laughs> But yeah, I like learning about people, I, and that's what life's about. It's about learning about people, hearing people's stories. And I say to the kids again, you've got to be a good listener. It's not about talking, it's about listening. And it's amazing what you can learn just listening. So when I had my career at 60 Minutes, my uh, eight or nine years there, that, that was just indulging my um, love of storytelling and listening to people and hearing their stories. And that's what television is all about. So that's where it comes from. Growing up, um, I was always very inquisitive and uh, I've been able to live my dream. And I, I don't think too many people in the world can say they, they've lived their dream since they were a young bloke wanting to work in TV and, and sure, be a yeah. part of news and current affairs. It's funny Absolutely. though, isn't it? You love interviewing people, but you don't like being interviewed yourself. 
hate it actually. And uh, you, I'll be a bit verbose. Already, I've been verbose today, and uh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking on my feet. And uh, so, yes, I love getting getting the answers out of people as opposed to you trying to talk to me. <laughs> well, it's interesting you mentioned Jessica, your lovely wife, Jessica Rowe, who I've worked with very closely. And I remember a classic moment where you were trying to ring her and she wasn't answering the phone and I said, oh, Jess is doing this. And he goes, how do you know where she is? I said, she put it on Twitter. And you're like, she tweets more than she speaks to me. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, uh, it, she is still the same, Rob. I, I can have 10, 12 cracks at trying to get her on the phone and I love it. She does, she's not ruled by her phone. She says, no, I've got to, I put the phone in a cupboard somewhere when the kids come home from school and I do what I do and that's prioritise the family. Um, but one day I had about 10, 12 cracks and I couldn't get her. So I sent her a text saying, dear Jessica, please advise best way to contact. Text, phone call, Twitter, <laughs> Instagram. How should I get in touch? Uh, by the way, um, someone has rung wanting to give you a free car, but they need to know within the next 10 minutes what colour you would like. The phone rang like that. The phone rang like that. <laughs> you know, um, you know Peter, what? one of my favourite memories is when uh, Jessica Rowe would be uh, on the desk at Studio 10 and she might say something a little blue uh, and there would be a text that would come through from PD saying, stop, <laughs> stop it, stop talking. Yeah. It was a wonderful moment to see you kind of in our show when, you know, you were on Nine, but we always had a little bit of Overton in our, in our show too, <laughs> which I thought was nice. Thank you, Robbo. Well, I, I like I, I would watch Studio Ten, and I go. I think you've gone far enough. Of course, he can. I think that might be just <laughs> enough on that subject. Um, but you know, she was she was such a great addition to that panel because it, it gave it was a, a different view, and it and it created conversation. And that's what, as Rob knows, as the EP of Studio Ten back in the day, that's what gives it. You can't all be just sitting there going like this. It's dynamic. You need you need conversation. You need. Um, opposing views, and uh, but sometimes yep. I go, whoa, no, 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 that's far enough. <laughs> the, the details. That was probably um, when she was talking about what was in her desk, in her bedroom top drawer, and things like that. Pete, I assume. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh well, Rob. you know, you know, um, <laughs> what I think is really missing from the landscape of media is curiosity. You know, I think that seems to be what people are missing. You see lots of radio and TV shows trying to get up and running and, and the presenters make it about themselves. I think it is about that curiosity and that yearning that you have to learn. And I think that's the magic of who you are and what's cut through to the audience. Where do your values of curiosity come from? Was that something that you grew up with from your family? Good question, Ben. Thank you. Um, I, I think, it, I, I don't know where it comes from. I I've certainly grew up in the most magnificent um, household in terms of my mum and dad. Uh, my dad was professor of paediatric anaesthesia at the Children's Hospital in Sydney for decades. And dad was always so interested in everyone else. And that rubs off on your children. And I know when he used to take us on rounds at the Children's Hospital, he knew all the security guards, all the cleaners, all the trolley men and women, the boiler makers, the plumbers. Now, Rob, will, Rob McKnight will attest that I'm the same at Channel 9. Yeah. I know all the security guards, the cleaners, the plumbers, <laughs> the air conditioning mechanics, and I know them by name and I know about their families and I stop and talk to them every single day because <laughs> they are as much a part of my success as anything because they, mm. we are a team. And... I, it enriches your life when you learn about other people and you can help other people and they can help you as well. So I think it stems from lessons my father taught me growing up going to the Children's Hospital in Sydney and meeting all these wonderful, wonderful people. And I'll never forget when Dad retired from the Children's Hospital, he, he was revered not only in Australia but internationally. And Australian Story did his retirement. And I was working for 60 Minutes and I did the intro to Australian Story on the banks of the Thames in London. And my punchline was this story, uh, this is my dad's story. And the last shot in that story was the cleaner standing on his mop like this going to say, we are going to miss the good professor. We are going to miss the good professor. And that, to me, sums up what my parents have given us as children, um, a real respect for other people and respect for knowing other people and saying, hello, how are you, and finding out what their news is. Well, I just want to ask you, Absolutely. because, and you're going to hate me for this, but 
I want to ask about your next door neighbour growing up. Now, your next door neighbour was Nicole Kidman, and I'm a big <laughs> fan of Kidman. And I uh, also believe that the Kidman's a big, uh, fa- like, big best friend or, or good friend of Annette, your sister. Um, do you still remember putting on those plays and charging your parents like five cents <laughs> with Nicole back in the day? And just for my own interest, what was it like being Nicole Kidman's neighbour? Well, I, I remember those plays and performances like they were yesterday. I was only allowed to be the ticket collector um, and show people <laughs> to their seats. Um, <laughs> and they were always held in Nicole's house and she was the star and rightly so <laughs> because she's a Oscar-winning global superstar these days. Um, it was terrific. She, look, she they were the family next door. Um, I'm now 54 years of age, so we're talking uh, uh, 40 plus, 45 years ago, and we're still um, fantastic family friends with them and see them when they're out here. Um, we'll catch up with them, the whole Overton family, with Nicole and Keith and Antonia and her husband Craig and Janelle, uh, Nicole and Antonia's mother. They are fantastic people. Um, and uh, yes, I, uh, it's been lovely to have this friendship. And indeed, one of my favourite interviews was early in the piece was with Nicole in Los Angeles. I think she'd just done the movie Bewitched. And it was quite yeah. surreal for both of us sitting across from each other at the Four Seasons Hotel in Beverly Hills doing the interview. But I'll never forget um, one of the very senior producers at 60 Minutes said to me when he looked at the interview, that was such an enjoyable interview, Peter, because you obviously knew each other so well and you mm. reminisced about uh, growing up together and, and you, you were both at ease with each other. And I'll, I, it was one of my favourite interviews because she's a first-class human being, um, a wonderful actor, a wonderful mother and, and wife, and, uh, yeah, great friend. So it was great to grow Good up with her. Values. and uh, Good family yeah, values, pops. I think it is. So, Pete, on that, though, when you're interviewing someone you're friends with, is it a harder interview because... You've got all this history, but you also don't want to be overstepping the friendship. So is it limiting when you interview someone that you're friends with? Uh, great question, Rob. Uh, in that, in, it, look, you, I suppose you, you know where to go and where you're not going to go, but you've still got to ask questions um, if, if uh, it's part of the narrative of the day. But, it, yeah, it can be a challenge. And luckily, I don't know many too many global movie stars, <laughs> Rob. That, that <laughs> but to no, be sorry. frank, the celebrities, the stars, were always the hardest ones to interview, I must say. And I think every reporter uh, will, will tell you that because a lot of them, they're just promoting a movie or, or whatever, and they mightn't have a big story behind them. So you've got to, you've got to sort of in 20 minutes look like you know each other really, really well, um, that you've... And you ask three or four questions about the movie and then you've got to go down the path to, to bring the story together. So about um, their lives or, or whatever. And that can be hard. But one of my favourites and the person who really got it was Tom Hanks. I interviewed him in Venice. Oh. I had 20 minutes with him and he understood wow. what my role was. And I clearly knew what he had to give me. And he gave it to me in spades. And I, I took the clock radio out of the uh, hotel I was staying in in Venice and I, I plugged it in just at uh, Tom's, the bottom of Tom's chair. And at the 16 minute mark of the 20 minutes I had, I knew I had everything I needed for a 12 minute story, but I needed to get a walk and talk as we call it. It looks like we're hanging out. And his publicist had said, no, no, that's not gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. But Tom and I, we'd had such a good interview and just off the interview, um, this ballroom overlooking Venice was this um, uh, a deck. I said, oh, Tom, would you would it be okay to step out? And we did a, a quick shot out there. He said, of course, of course, Peter. And I had four minutes. So we, the publicists were huffing and puffing, but they yeah, couldn't do anything about it. <laughs> and we went out. And in that four minutes, Tom, he knew what we wanted. He gave us a beginning to the story, a middle to the story, and an end to the story. And he got the cameraman almost to reposition in every, every spot. And it was just, oh. Brilliant. So that's my, my, 
He and McCall, one of my favourites, yeah. Shows you what you can do in four minutes, and there's a reason why, and I know this for a fact, if Pink is ever, the singer Pink, if she is ever doing an interview in Australia, she wants to do it on 60 Minutes, and she wants Peter Overton to do the interview, and that is a fact. (laughs) Well, I had a... She she was a fabulous interview. I've done interviewed her twice. Wow. She's managed by an Australian, of course, the legendary Roger Davies, and um, she she is the real deal, that woman. Oh, what a performer. And Roger, have we got time, Rob, to tell another story? Why? not <laughs> yeah go for it we're just going to get the popcorn out <laughs> <laughs> so roger he, he knew the value remember pink sold out all those concerts the records in australia yeah. and and yeah. she was coming for another tour so he knew the value of 60 minutes i think we got close to i won't i don't want to give the figure but it was over one and a half million viewers i think for that story back then and he hired a whole sound stage at sony motion pictures in la had a whole band had pink had um, the daughter Willow and her husband Carrie. Yes. They were all there. We and he knew it would be so good for 60 minutes in Australia. But obviously, he's going to sell more concerts, isn't it? And we, she and I, drove around in a golf buggy, and it was just fantastic. I a really story. I, I actually promoted that story, and I never knew that they hired out the soundstage just for you because I thought it was actual rehearsal. So there you go. I've learned something. Well, maybe they were doing. Maybe they'd hired no, it for a few I'm days for rehearsals. I'm going with this version. I like that. Much You're a good better. man. You're a good <laughs> man. It, it's common knowledge. I'm a big fan. I. I think you're terrific. I've loved our friendship over the years and uh, thank you for doing the Ben Robin Robbo show today. You're a true gentleman. I've loved, uh, I've loved seeing you, Robbo and Rob and Ben. Lovely to meet you um, and uh, congratulations on your show. As I said at the beginning, it's about supporting our industry in tough times and I think you guys are amazing for having a real crack at what you do and I love it. You do a great job. Thank you, Pete. We'll see you soon. Thank you, sir. It's the Ben, Rob and Rob, oh Ben, Rob and Rob, oh Shen.